Corinthians chapter 9. We're in the, we've been studying through 1 Corinthians for a while now under the overarching theme, Christian, oh, pardon me, the perfect gospel for an imperfect church. The gospel is perfect. There's nothing wrong with it. Even when it's communicated by imperfect people, there's nothing wrong with the gospel. One of the devil's lies that I know he tells some of you is that you don't know enough. You're not good enough. You're not consistent enough. You're not faithful enough. You don't repent enough. You don't, it goes, just whatever, whatever he can hang on enough to silence you, he will do. I want you to know something today. Imperfect vessels are enabled by God to proclaim the perfect gospel. Otherwise, I would walk off this podium right now. There's nothing in me native to me that qualifies me to preach to you. And I'm constrained, like we're going to see Paul is constrained. And I'm convinced, woe would I be if I did not preach the gospel. So I want to, as we get ready to study today, I want to free some of you. Don't let the devil lie to you. Remember the guy, the man born blind in John 9? He'd not been to Sunday school one time. He'd not been raised in a home that taught him about Jesus. He encountered Jesus. Jesus caused him to see. And he began to tell about him. And he got in big trouble for it. And finally he, he looked. He was able to look with his eyes at the leaders of the Pharisees who were taunting him. And he said, why do you want to know about this man? Do you want to be one of his disciples too? If you're a follower of Jesus Christ here today, you know enough to share Jesus with somebody. And Christ is enough, more than enough, to meet every need you, you sense in the anticipation of that and the expression of that. We're looking at this matter of Christian liberty uh, in this section beginning in chapter 8, verse 1. It'll go through, uh, I think, the end of, uh, end of 10, right into 10. It's misunderstood today. I've told you two ditches you've got to stay out of. The ditch of legalism, where you take external rules that maybe you were raised with, maybe you've been taught in place of the gospel, and you make that the gospel. The Pharisees were masters at legalism. And Jesus said, when they made a convert, he was twice as fit for hell as he had been before they introduced him to their thinking. The other ditch is the ditch of licentiousness. And this is a problem in America, in the West. When people hear liberty, it processes for a libertine or licentious attitude that I can do whatever I want to do. Well, the truth is a lost person can only do what his nature inclines him to do. And a Christian is set free from the bondage of sin and death and is enabled to please God. But we're never saved to do what we want to do. In fact, when we're saved, our want to is fixed. When we're saved, we want to please God. So with that little bit of a reminder, let's look at 1 Corinthians chapter 9, verses 1 to 23. Find that in your Bibles. If you don't have a Bible, we're going to put it on the screen for you today. I'm going to read through the whole passage. We got through verse 14 last week, but I want you to hear the context of 1 Corinthians chapter 9, verses 1 to 23. Stand with me if you would. Follow along as I read from God's Word. Am I not free? Am I not an apostle? Have I not seen Jesus our Lord? Are not you my workmanship in the Lord? If to others I'm not an apostle, at least I am to you, for you are the seal of my apostleship in the Lord. This is my defense to those who would examine me. Do we not have the right to eat and drink? Do we not have the right to take along a believing wife, as do the other apostles and the brothers of the Lord and Cephas? Or is it only Barnabas and I who have no right to refrain 
from working for a living? Who serves as a soldier at his own expense? Who plants a vineyard without eating any of its fruit? Who tends a flock without getting some of the milk? Do I say these things on human authority? Does not the law say the same thing? For it's written in the law of Moses, you shall not muzzle an ox while it treads out the grain. Is it for oxen? And the idea here, is it for oxen only that God is concerned? Does he not certainly speak for our sake? It was written for our sake, because the plowman should plow in hope, and the thresher thresh in hope of sharing in the crop. If we've sown spiritual things among you, is it too much if we reap material things from you? If others share this rightful claim on you, do not we even more? Nevertheless, we've not made use of this right, but we endure anything rather than put an obstacle in the way of the gospel of Christ. Do you not know that those who are employed in the temple of service get their food from the temple? And those who serve at the altar share in the sacrificial offerings? In the same way, the Lord commanded that those who proclaim the gospel should get their living by the gospel. That's what we looked at last week. Now for this week. But I've made no use of any of these rights, nor am I writing these things to secure any such provision. For I would rather die than have anyone deprive me of my ground for boasting. For if I preach the gospel, that gives me no ground for boasting. For necessity is laid upon me. Woe to me if I do not preach the gospel. For if I do this of my own will, I have a reward. But if not of my own will, I'm still entrusted with stewardship. What then is my reward? That in my preaching, I may present the gospel free of charge, so as not to make full use of my right in the gospel. For though I am free from all, I am free from all, I've made myself a servant to all, that I might win more of them. To the Jews, I became as a Jew, in order to win Jews. To those under the law, I became as one under the law, though not being myself under the law, that I might win those under the law. To those outside the law, I became as one outside the law, not being outside the law of God, but under the law of Christ, that I might win those outside the law. To the weak, I became weak, that I might win the weak. I become all things to all people, that by all means I might save some. I do it all for the sake of the gospel that I may share with them in its blessings. We just read together one. The inerrant, infallible, all-sufficient Word of God. Let me ask you this question. What did you do this week, intentionally, for the sake of the gospel? Paul was driven by that. What did you do this week, intentionally, for the sake of the gospel? May the Lord teach us that liberty as you have on your bulletin. Liberty is a wonderful field given to us by the Lord Jesus Christ. When the Son sets you free, you're free indeed, he says. Liberty is a wonderful field, but it has a fence around it. And it's the fence of self-denial. Thank you. Please be seated. Well, we looked in chapter 8 about how love is, uh, has a restraint upon our liberty. Paul talked about there are things that that we are free to do, that we probably sometimes should not do if it becomes a stumbling block to others. And so out of our love for them, we will give up our liberty in order to love one another better. In chapter 9, he shifts the emphasis, starts talking about himself as an apostle, as a Christian, He's asking these rhetorical questions. I mean, when you read through chapter 9, you know the answers. Am I not free? Well, sure you're free, Paul. Am I not an apostle? Well, sure you're an apostle, Paul. Have I not seen Jesus our Lord? Well, yes, you encountered him on the Damascus Road. And he says, I know there are others who say that I'm not an apostle. We talked about those, those folks. He says, surely to you I'm an apostle. I labored among you 18 months. I was pleased to birth a church in Corinth. You're my seal. If anyone says, well, Paul's not called of God to be an apostle, Paul would say, you ought to be able to say, well, look, how do you explain Corinth then? How do you explain one of the most wicked cities in, the West, in, that, in that part of the world and a church of Jesus Christ being birthed there? And so Paul's arguing these, these rhetorical questions, and I told you last week that 
He establishes his rights as a Christian and as an apostle. Then we would look this week at these two other ideas. He would remind the readers of his willing renunciation of those rights in the interest of the gospel. And then he would finally point to other concessions that were made by him for the sake of the gospel. Having gone through what we went through last week, he comes to say in verse 15, but I made, he, he gave six reasons that he, he could expect to be, receive remuneration, compensation for proclaiming the gospel. It says in verse 15, but I have made no use of any of these rights, nor am I writing these things to secure my own provision. I'm not saying the things I'm saying in a backhanded way of saying, well, oh, no, 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 I, I don't want any money. I, I, don't, I don't want any money. I, I, I don't have any expectations. He said, I'm not doing that to you. I made no use of this. He says, I don't want to be robbed of a ground for boasting. And we're going we're gonna to see what he's talking about there. He reminded the church in Thessalonica. Look at 1 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 9. For you remember, brothers, our labor and toil. We worked night and day that we might not be a burden to any of you while we proclaim to you the gospel of God. Paul's practice was that when he went into a place, he was a tent maker, remember? He, he had developed a, uh, a, a business trade of making tents. When we come into a place like Thessalonica with a completely Jewish pedigree in the pagan lands, having become a follower of Jesus Christ, so he's, he's coming with a, out of a background that pagans would despise. They would despise Judaism because if they had hung around any Jews growing up, they would have been familiar with being called Gentile dogs. If they were around some real strict Jews, then they might have experienced the unhappy providence of walking in the street when a Jewish person was walking, going, on, going to the way to synagogue, and the shadow of this Gentile pass, pass over the Jew, and the Jew say, oh my goodness, I'm ceremonially unclean, I can't even go to church now because the shadow of a Gentile dog just passed over me. That's what the pagans understood of Judaism. So Paul came with this Jewish background, this confessing of faith in Jesus of Nazareth. And in the minds, think about this folks, in the minds of people who grew up under the influence of Rome, which was that world of that day, Rome dominated the world, Paul was considered an atheist because he rejected all the Roman pantheon of gods. So this atheist, and from their vantage point, would come into their community and begin to preach Jesus. They'd preach him in the synagogue, so they threw him out there. He'd preach him in the streets, in the marketplaces. And he did not come in and say, look, I'm starting a church. I need, some, I need some financial support. He didn't go into Thessalonica, try to raise financial support for a church. He labored with his own hands. He wouldn't remove any possible offense because he knew the message he preached would be offensive enough. That's what he's telling them here. Remember when I came to you in Thessalonica, what I did. I didn't want to be a burden to you. 2 Thessalonians 3, 8, if you want to pick up the, the, in, the, in the next letter he wrote to Thessalonica. Nor did we eat anyone's bread without paying for it, but with toil and labor we worked night and day that we might not be a burden to any of you. It's interesting, if you, if you know Paul's journeys, you know, after he left Thessalonica and went on to other church planting, he would write to them. He would send emissaries to them and say, Paul needs financial help. He didn't ask for it while he was there. He didn't want that to be an offense. 2 Corinthians 11, verses 8 and 9, a similar thing he writes to the church at Corinth. I robbed other churches. Listen to this. I robbed other churches by accepting support from them in order to serve you. So follow his agenda. 
If he's laboring in a particular city, he is not going to take money or ask for money or act as if he expects money for preaching the gospel there, even when a church is established. But when he leaves that city to go plant another church as he's led by the Lord, he would send communication back to them. And this is what he's describing here at Corinth. I robbed other churches. He was not a robber. It's a picture that he's giving them in order to serve you. And when I was with you and was in need, I did not burden anyone for the brothers who came from Macedonia supplied my need. So I refrained and will refrain from burdening you in any way. That's Paul's agenda. He could say to the Ephesian elders, as he's meeting with them for the last time in Acts chapter 20, verses 30 to 35, I coveted no one's silver or gold or apparel. You yourselves know that these hands ministered to my necessities and to those who were with me. In all things, I have shown you that by working hard in this way, we must help the weak and remember the words of the Lord Jesus, how he himself said, it is more blessed to give than to receive. So you've got to have that background of Paul to understand what he's saying here. So when, when we think about his willingness to renounce his rights, which comes up in verses 15 and following, he says, I've made no use of any of these rights, nor am I writing these things to secure any such provision. For I would rather die than have anyone deprive me of my ground for boasting. For if I preach the gospel, that gives me no ground for boasting. Understand this. I know guys, it's tragic to see, who become full of pride when they, when they take on the mantle of preaching. Brothers and sisters, nothing to be proud of. If you're preaching by God's calling, then God called you. And he didn't call you because he was impressed with anything about you. In fact, I think more often than not, he takes those folks there who are not impressive. Nothing to commend themselves. And Paul was there, by the way. When you hear Paul describe himself, he had some, some interesting physical problems, physical markings. He apparently was, was almost blind, so he would have to read. He took this, this uh, crippled, hampered Pharisee he made him claimer of the gospel of Jesus Christ. There's no ground of boasting when you preach the gospel. He says, preaching the gospel gives me no ground of boasting. For necessity is laid upon me. Woe to me if I do not preach the gospel. I had a, I had a man say to me, this is back when I was in my 20, 21, a long time ago, I'm glad I can remember it. He said, son, if you can do anything else in this world and have a sense that you're honoring God, do it. Don't pursue preaching. He, this was an elderly pastor. I said, why? He said, because there will come times in your life when all you've got is the confidence that God called you to do what you're doing. He said, if you don't have that, Paul, you'll fail. I've taken that to heart for years. And Karen and I have journeyed together for 43 years in marriage. And we talked about the day would come someday. I don't know what that day looks like. When I would have to seriously consider stepping aside. But I'll be honest with you, brothers, uh, I can't imagine myself doing anything else in this world. I have a real grip that Paul has here, this compulsion, woe be to me if I do not preach the gospel. Necessity was laid upon him. So if he, if he didn't want to be deprived of boasting, and boasting is not found in being called to preach, or in preaching, or in preaching for a long time. Here's the boasting he's talking about. He says, if I do this, verse 17, of my own will, I have a reward. 
if I'm just, if I'm just doing this because I want to, because I thought it'd be really, I, I'm, and folks, I met people in seminary who scared the stew out of me because that was their attitude. Well, I didn't know what else to do. So I thought, and I had some, I, and Karen can remember some of these folks. They lived right down the hall from us in our apartment complex. I had this, I had this GI Bill money, didn't know what to do with it. So I thought I would just enter the ministry. One of them said one time, he said, the Lord called me to the ministry and my wife answered. Strange stuff. You hear strange stuff in a, in, in a seminary complex apartment living. He said, if I'm doing it of my own will, not under some divine compulsion, then that is reward in itself. Because I'll be honest with you, the ministry has its challenges, but it's a wonderful privilege. It's a wonderful privilege to minister to you. It's a wonderful privilege. I, I'm amazed every morning when I get up, I have the privilege of doing this. I'm amazed Sunday by Sunday when I get here and you come back. It's really amazing sometimes. I thank God for that. I do. It's a privilege. So if it's not under compulsion, if it's just because he wants to, then what is that? He said, but... I have been compelled by God. It's a stewardship that I have. So verse 18, then what is my reward? That in my preaching, I may present the gospel free of charge so as not to make full use of my right in the gospel. Remember, liberty, self-denial. What's he talking about here? He's saying I have the right to say to you, let him who lives preaching the gospel Make his living from that. He has, I have the right to say that. He said, but I'm going to deny myself. I'm not going to say that. This was his boasting. So that people could not impugn his motives. Even though, by the way, if you read 2 Corinthians, if you read the, the collection of letters, there was a group of people always impugning the motives of Paul. <laughs> Paul had something difficult to say. Folks say, oh, yeah, Paul talks a big game, but there's nothing to he. He's, his, his bark is much worse than his bite. If he was writing to them saying, we need to get this collection underway so the saints in Jerusalem can be fed, uh, Paul's a con man. Don't believe that stuff. You can't trust him. Throughout his ministry, he, met, he faced that. So he had this confidence that he'd been called by God to do what he was doing. And then he, he had the capacity, and I'll be honest with you, through the years, I have found myself very jealous of Paul. It's one of the things, if someone said one time, if you could go back and do something different, what would you do? I said, the only thing I can think of is I would, I would cultivate a way to earn a living so that I would never have to take from the treasury of the church. Just, I, I admire Paul for that. Rejoice that he was there. That he was a missionary traveling, planting churches to be sure, receiving support from the churches he had planted, not the church that he was planting currently. I recognize all of that. But he says, here's my boasting. When I come into a town, I'm not a burden to the people whom God's pleased to save through the preaching of the gospel. But I become a great encourager to them. They don't suddenly find themselves under an additional stretch because the gospel has come to their lives. That's his, that's his thinking here, folks. You've got to understand this. And it's a wonderful expression of Christian liberty. That's why we need to stop and think, okay, how, how can I apply this to my life? What have I done this week for the sake of the gospel? What have I given up this week for the sake of the gospel? I'm not talking about Lent. I'm talking about in day-to-day -day living, in day-to-day -day engaging. Neighbors, friends, family, loved ones, enemies, strangers. What have I done for the sake of the gospel? That's what Paul is telling us here. That's how he thinks. That's how he acts. Well, then there's these other concessions that he made in verses 19 to 23. Look at these with me here. Verse 19, for though I am free from all, in other words, 
having been saved by grace through faith, he is now Christ's bondservant. No man is his master, for Jesus is his master. And he has that same spirit about him that Peter and John had when the, when the religious leaders arrested them, beat them, and said, you need to stop preaching in this man's name. And they said, whether it seems good for you to us to do that or not, it's up to you. But know this, we must obey God rather than man. They would stand in the face of the religious authority of the day. And beat us if you must. Jail us if you will. But you cannot stop us preaching this name. That was Paul's, Paul's tenacious attitude. So I'm free from all. Watch what he's done for the sake of the gospel. Taking Christian liberty, practicing self-denial. I have made myself a servant to all. That I might win more of them. And he talks about these things. You cannot read this and think, well, Paul really was wishy-washy. No, keep focused what he's doing. The way he acts toward different groups of people is driven by his having one master, Jesus, and wanting to see his gospel penetrate hearts and lives. Watch. To the Jews, I became as a Jew. Wait a minute. You were born and raised a Jew. You said you were a Hebrew among Hebrews, a Pharisee of Pharisees. Now read on when he describes that pedigree of his. And whatsoever things looked valuable to me, I counted as what? Dung for the excellency of Jesus Christ. So, in one sense, he had turned his back on Judaism because he turned his face toward Jesus. But in another sense, when he was with Jews and they would practice their ceremonial cleansing, if they were washing for some, some meeting they were getting ready for and offered the bowl to him, he wouldn't say, I don't do that anymore. I'm a Christian. No. If he was among Jews, wanted a hearing from Jews, he would wash. He knew it was just water. If they were keeping certain days, certain feasts and festivals, he didn't say, don't you understand all this has come to an end in Jesus Christ? No. He would be with them. I became a Jew in order to win Jews. To those under the law, and commentators differ here, by the way. Some think he's extending his description of the Jews being under the law. It seems, though, that he was probably talking about proselyte Jews. When he was with those who did not have a, a, a native Jewish background, but who as Gentiles had turned their back on the pagan culture and had come through proselyte uh, baptism to become identified as a Jew. So to those un who had placed themselves under law, I became as one under the law. That's what he says though. Though not being myself under the law. In other words, I did not forget that I've been set free in Christ, but I simply met them where they were. Brothers and sisters, this is, this is the doctrine, the biblical doctrine of accommodation. There's a difference between accommodating someone where they are and compromising biblical convictions. Paul does this. We need to study him more. We need to understand how he moved in his society and ourselves move in our society. One of the dangers we have you saw it in the turn of the century, uh, not this most recently, the turn of the last century, was fundamentalism when fundamentalists retreated from the public arena. And because of that, we gave up. We gave up footholds in theater, in media, uh, in literature, in, in, in education, in social work. We left the field. And it's cost us dearly. It's going to be hard ground to get back. Paul says, I, I met them where they were. I was willing to accommodate my beliefs without compromising my convictions. I met them where they were. And he goes on about this. That I might win those under the law. To those outside the law. Pagans here. I became as one outside the law. 
not being outside the law of God, but under the law of Christ. He says, I never was lawless. You've got to understand what he's saying, what he's not saying. He never said, well, I'm just going to go uh, get wasted with these guys. No, the scripture teaches drunkenness is a sin. Paul would never have gotten wasted for the, for the sake of Jesus. There's, if you're aware today, if you're paying attention, if you're reading, you know that in Christendom, in the West, there are people who suggest that we go whole hog and dive into the cesspool with the pagans in order to meet them. No, Paul never did that. He didn't stand by the pool and say, you bunch of filthy pigs. He didn't do that. He met them where they were because he had a goal. And that goal was to win them to Christ. And part of the reason that people think Christians are so goofy, so judgmental, so temperamental, uh, so looking down our nose at others is because too often we do. This is not a total caricature. What have you done this week for the sake of the gospel? Think about it. Culture running headlong to hell. And if we act like Winnie the Pooh and go, that's too bad. It's awful. You've got to stop them. You've got to reach out to them. You've got to weep for them. You've got to pray for them. You've got to pray with them. You've got to listen to them. You've got to meet them where they are. But we ourselves would never go there willingly for entertainment, for pleasure. Meet them where they are. I remember my friend Conrad in Bayway. He was with us. I'm not sure if he told this story when he was here or not, but he told, told us, care myself about it. At the Lusaka, uh, the church in, in Lusaka, began to reach out to some prostitutes. The Lord began to save prostitutes in Lusaka, Zambian. And they showed up at Kabwata Baptist Church. They took them into their home. Care for them. Clean them up. Get them back to health. Get them jobs. One of the women began to come and say, Pastor, do you understand the presence of these women is tempting our husbands? What do you do? We want to see prostitutes saved. We just want to, don't want to see them around us. No, no, that's not what you do. Not an option. Paul is wanting to see people from all backgrounds saved. And so he, he was always operating under the law of Christ, which, by the way, parenthetically, is not different from the law of God. The law of God is on stone, Ten Commandments. The law of Christ is on the heart. Ten Commandments, driven by love, compassion. That's what he's saying here. That I might win those outside the law. To the weak I became weak. He's already talked about the weak in chapter 8. That I might win the weak. Help them to become strong. Help them to overcome their scruples. I become all things to all people, that by all means I might save some. He, has, he is not a jellyfish. He's a man with a, with a steel backbone for the gospel. He will not compromise one iota of his convictions, but he will accommodate unbelievers wherever and whenever he can to get a hearing from them. There's tension there, I recognize. But if we're going to engage this culture, we better learn some of this. I want to commend to you a, a pamphlet by my brother Tom Askell. He wrote years ago, The Biblical Principle of accommodation. If you can't find it, if you can Google it and find it, if you can't, let me know. I'll send you the PDF of it. You need to read it, meditate on it, learn to apply it. I become all things to all people. 23. I do it for the sake of the gospel that I may share with them in its blessings. Here's the question, isn't it? 
Why do you do what you do? Why do you do what you do? Paul did what he did for the sake of the gospel. We can't say we love Paul's writings. We admire Paul's mission and life. If we're not learning and consciously saying, well, I need to do that too. You may say today, well, I've never thought about that. Really, That's okay. It's not a sin to not have thought it through. It's a sin to encounter it and say, nah, that's just not me. This is not unique to Paul. This is a heartbeat that God cultivates in the lives of followers of Jesus Christ. We have to remind ourselves of this. Jesus said it. He's the one who set the agenda. You want to come after me? You want to be my follower, my disciple, my student, carry my name? Deny yourself. Yeah. Deny yourself. But that's uncomfortable, Lord. Yeah. So are nails on a cross. They're pretty uncomfortable too. Deny yourself. Take up your cross. You mean like this necklace I have? No. Take up your cross. If you're going to deny yourself, you've got to have a cross nearby. The self's got to be nailed to it over and over and over again. My dear friend R.F. Gates used to tell me, he said, Bill, what we do with self, we have to intentionally pin it down to the cross and drive the nails through the hands and the feet of self and pound them hard and pound them deep so that self cannot move from the cross. And then when self begins to complain, we need to ignore it. But if we don't, what's going to happen is self's going to say, I'm thirsty. Something to drink. You're ignoring me. Thirsty. Give me something to drink. He said, we're going to make the mistake of feeding self, giving some touching water to the lips so that self can get strengthened. He said, the next thing we're going to hear from self is, I'm thirsty. Give me something to drink. He said, when we hear that, we need to take the hammer again, go back to that cross, and pound those nails deeper than we've ever pounded them. We must put to death the flesh. We must put to death self. We must deny ourselves. We must use the cross to do it daily. And follow me, Jesus said. See, a lot of folks want to follow him. Follow, follow. I will follow Jesus. Anywhere, everywhere, I will follow him. I notice, though, that you don't have a cross with you. You can't. I can't. I can't follow Jesus without a cross nearby. Because self will be sure to get in the way. And if I'm going to do something today for the sake of the gospel, then I've got to intentionally evaluate how should I deny myself? How should I nail self to the cross so that I can be in a position to become whoever I need to become to touch the Jews. I don't know who the Jews are in your life. I don't know who the pagans are in your life. But they're not there accidentally. I know that. The God who's sovereign in providence has put them there. What am I doing? Well, let's forget last week. We're going to leave here. What am I going to do? God being my helper, what am I going to do for the sake of the gospel so that I can, have, I can share this gospel and have a shared experience in the blessings of the gospel with these whom God has providentially put in my path? The Jews, non-Jews, The religious, the non-religious, Christian liberty.
can quickly become licentiousness if we're not thinking about how Jesus Christ came, lived a life of self-denial every day, gave up his life, laying down his life so that sinners could be saved, dying on the cross, there satisfying God's divine justice concerning sin by suffering and dying in our place, rising from the grave three days later to prove that he had conquered every enemy we have, sin, death, hell, and the grave, and even selfishness, even self, even the hesitance to deny self. He killed all those things, folks, for us. And if we're going to be followers of Christ, 2018, to a generation is, I think it's fair to say is more confused about basic things than any generation in the history of this nation, then we're going to have to embrace Paul's agenda. Say, seize opportunities to do, I want to do it for the sake of the gospel. Let's pray. Dear Holy Father, you are the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, and we, we bow before you in Jesus' name and thank you for your word. It's not, it's not easy to gaze into. It's, it's, a, it's, it's piercing and bright, and it really is a two-edged sword, and it cuts to the very deepest parts of our being. But Lord, as best we know our hearts, those of us here who name the name of Jesus want to be identified with Jesus. As best we know our hearts, there are people on our hearts whom we want to see come to faith in Christ. Teach us, Lord, if this is not easy and it's different for, for every one of us in our circumstances, teach us how to become all things to all men so that by any reasonable means, without sinning, we may be used by you to see and come to faith in Christ. Help us to learn to live, to breathe, to move, to have our being, this pulsating awareness for the sake of the gospel. For those here who are not yet followers of Christ, I pray that, that you would put them in touch with folks in our congregation who are, who are hammering out this living for the sake of the gospel, and that the gospel would become so compelling, so appealing, so winsome, so attractive, that they would be drawn to Christ as altogether lovely, would repent of sin, confess faith in Christ, and come to Him and join this journey of daily denying ourselves, daily taking up our crosses, daily committing to follow Jesus Christ to the very end. For we ask it in His name. Amen. Let's stand.